right. Good morning, everybody. It's the Advanced EL Support class, and I'm Mr. Wilcox. It's May the 18th, Monday, May 18th. This is our last official final week of school. Uh, we have two classes this week. We don't have a class on Monday or Tuesday for any of your classes. And then Thursday, Friday of next week is uh, the last culminating wrap up final lesson for each class. Uh, period one, two, and three on Thursday and period four, five, and six on Friday. So very exciting, summer's looming. Hope you guys uh, <clears throat> are having a good time. Okay, uh, I was gonna have you guys do between now and Thursday, um, just a deer lock. Okay, we're doing that pattern where on Thursdays I'll give you a short poem of some kind and we're trying to look at different types of figurative language, right? A key fuel that poetry runs on. Uh, it's part of that expansion of meaning and expansion of language, right? Uh, and uh, then on Monday we go over it and I assign you just a deer log to get to meet by Thursday, just to keep you guys reading. And don't forget that you can use whatever material you are studying in your other English class. Uh, for that dear read, even if it's the textbook that you're doing, you can just write up a little ditty, a little bit, a little paragraph of a half page or more on what you guys are reading, right? So make this work for you. I want this to be supportive of the other English class, and hopefully you'll ultimately find these figurative language lessons useful, all right? Um, let's briefly review the different types of figurative language that we have talked about so far, because several types of figurative language appear in the sick rose, which I want to go over today. We're focusing on symbol, but again, any great poet is using all these different types of figurative language uh, to create an effect, and they'll weave them together in intricate little patterns. And this is a perfect example, an eight-line poem, I think, the sick rose, that says a lot about human life, and really very typical William Blake poem, one of the better British poets that we have, but one of the better poets in the English language, I would even go so far as to say. All right, so metaphor is what we started with <clears throat> as figurative language. Metaphor is a comparison in language between two unlike things. Remember, if you're comparing two people's eyes or two people's haircuts or something, that's not a metaphor. Those are similar things. They have to be different things that are compared. There's some point of similarity between them, all right? And that's a literal equation, right? Um, a dream deferred explodes sometimes. That's a metaphor. It's literally saying a dream is a bomb, right? And remember, they don't always say what it's compared to. Sometimes you have to kind of figure out what explodes. Oh, a bomb. That's what they're comparing it to, okay? Personification. Oh, and those go simile, simile. Uh, metaphor's cousin, I guess. <clears throat> a simile is a comparison in language between two unlike things using like or as. So you're not literally saying those two things are the same. You're saying they're similar or like each other or as big as each other or something like that. There's extra words involved in the comparison, okay? And then there's personification, which we talked about with a Song of the Powers. Um, person being the first six letters of personification, that should always be your clue, your mnemonic device, how you remember it, right? Something is compared to a person or it's given person-like, human-like qualities personification all right and we have that poem about rock paper scissors uh, and then we get to symbol <clears throat> which is slightly more complex and, and I guess you could say deep deep here's the uh, definition I gave you guys last time it hasn't fared very well it got stepped on on the floor a couple times here in the intervening time but symbol an object person or action that means more or suggests more than what it literally means, okay? And I went ahead and took the opportunity to making the example a rose. I thought that would be easier. And uh, Rose, I hope you're doing well. Um, you have a lovely name, Rose. We all know that Rose is in our class, right? Um, <clears throat> named after this lovely flower, among other things, although your other name, your um, beautiful Iranian name is lovely also. Um, a rose is often a symbol of or symbolizes beauty, love, passion, or life itself. Life itself. So there's four different things that a rose has come to mean. And you guys can see this um, just in daily life, right? Roses are used for Valentine's Day to express love. The color of the rose, as I discussed last time, has some symbolic value. It's part of the message that you're giving to somebody when you give them roses. Okay. Um, so even just looking at those four things that a rose could symbolize, I think you can see that it 
feeds into four different levels of the poem or four different possible interpretations. That's the amazing thing about a symbol. What is different between a metaphor or a simile and a symbol? Well, a metaphor or a simile, you're comparing two things and there's one similarity, right? Just one point of comparison, generally. A symbol can mean many different things. So it means what it means. It, the rose is a rose. But in the language of the poem, it stretches it until you can see it symbolizing many different things. It's a rose being eaten or invaded or penetrated by a canker worm, which actually happens. There's a particular worm that likes to burrow into roses and destroys them from within. But look at the power of that image. There's so many other things in human life that that suggests, things that start good or that you want or that you love, and then something makes it go poison or toxic or turn bad or destroys it, right? Think about life so much that captures something about life. And so the rose and the worm in the poem refuse to just remain roses and worms. They, they stretch to suggest other meanings. All right. So that's what I really want to focus on. Uh, a symbol is deeper and more meaningful, possibly, and requires more of you, the reader, than simply a metaphor or a simile or a personification. Not to take anything away from those. They're great, too. All right. But we're looking at symbol today. Okay, so let's see if we can uh, <clears throat> do a screen share thing. And uh, where is it? Bam. There it is. Okay, cool. More or less functional. Yeah. All right, good. Cool. Well, let me take a sip of coffee here and then let's dive into this. I obviously wanted you guys to begin by... <clears throat> drawing out some definitions that you were going to need for this poem. See if we can cluster them all in the, on the screen here. Come on, little box. Okay. Cool. Um, this poem was written in the 1800s, so it uses some older type of British English that um, in America at some point we decided we weren't going to use anymore, and actually I don't think they use it in Britain, in England anymore either. All right? But thou means you. You. All right, it's something you, it's referred to you as, a, as an object, sort of, right? Um, so you, just think of it as meaning you. Invisible, obviously that means that you can't see it. Visible is to be able to be seen. Invisible, that prefix that you put on it means can't see it. Worm, ugh, worm, yeah, those squiggly little things, right? Um, that burrow in the dirt and, you know, eat dead things and all that stuff. So the worm is kind of a disturbing image of uh, decay or rotting, decomposition or something, eating something, something destroying something, attacking something. Howl, bow, is what the wolves do, okay? Or dog, maybe. Or you can howl in pain, too. But generally, howling is associated with an animal type of noise. And as we know, wolves are pretty famous for their ability to howl. Remember the word wolf. It's a noun that ends in F. And what happens when you make it a plural when there's more than one wolf? That's right. The F changes to a VE and you get wolves, wolves. One wolf, two or more wolves. Okay, thank you, teachable moment. Uh, thy simply means your, as in it's a possessive, it belongs to you. And crimson is sort of a deep blood red, a deep blood red. Right, maybe like a dark burgundy, or uh, I don't know. If you have to, just fall back to red. Okay, so there is the words that we decided we needed to define. It's only an eight-line poem, but remember, poetry is about compression. You, you, with few words, you say as much as you possibly can. All right, and that's why it doesn't matter if there's rhyme or if you have um, it in lines. Right, you can have sentences and regular writing that is poetic because it uses language in this way. So here it is, The Sick Rose by William Blake. I will read it, and then let's talk about it a little bit, shall we? Uh, the Sick Rose. O oh, rose, thou art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. William Blake, ladies and gentlemen, for me, it doesn't get much better. <laughs> um, but let's get to the analysis of this poem in terms of its figurative language, because 
most poems feature figurative language. And to get to the bottom of that is to really unlock it and to have the bottom drop out and really see how deep this can be, right? What is personified in this poem? Let's start with personification. Even though symbol is the main, most important type of figurative language in this poem, Blake is such a skilled poet that he uses other devices, right? And we just need to appreciate them in isolation. Uh, what's personified? The rose is personified, right? To some extent, the worm is also, okay? But, oh, rose, thou art sick. Look at that first line. You're talking to a rose. The rose can't speak back to you. What are you expecting here, right? Well, obviously, this is a poetic device. Um, you speak to the rose as if it's a human. And also notice, many of you guys pointed this out in your work that you submitted to me. Uh, the rose is sick, and that automatically more inclines us to think of it in human terms. So in that first line, the rose is personified. So initially we're expected to see it as a person, I think, right? Uh, but we'll see that actually the bottom drops out of that meaning as well. And the rose becomes a very deep, rich symbol here. All right. Um, so the rose is the answer to number one. <laughs> number two, what is the storm compared to? Um, you guys did a lot of interesting thinking about this, but all I was really looking at was line four here. And I probably could have been, well, I guess I did say that, uh, the howling storm, the storm's howling. So go back to your vocabulary. What does that mean, right? The storm is howling. What's it compared to? It's not compared to a howl. A howl is something that is emitted by something else, which is, let's say, a wolf or a wild animal. Okay, so the storm is crazy, it's wild, it's howling. It almost makes it a bit terrifying, at least to me, to this reader. Okay, so the storm is compared to a wolf or a wild animal, something that howls. We call this an implied metaphor because they don't say what it's compared to, it's implied. So you have to kind of like use your brain, do an extra bit of interpretation to get the richness of that line, all right? So storm is a metaphor here. We got personification. Now we have metaphor. Again, just appreciate momentarily how delicate the process is of this interweaving that Mr. Blake is doing. What's the worm doing to the rose? This is just basic plot stuff. <clears throat> the worm is eating into the rose. The worm is penetrating the rose. The worm is getting inside and, as I said before, killing it from within or corrupting it somehow from inside. Okay, so think of what the rose could represent at this point. We started with kind of looking at it as a woman, but remember the other things that it suggests just immediately, right? We've got beauty, love, passion, or life, more like concepts that the rose can make us think of and that it represents as a symbol already in our culture, all right? So the worm is a destructive element. It's an agent of corruption of some kind, all right? So anything that conforms to this pattern, we can kind of interpret, right? A symbol is a range of meaning. There's more than one answer. And the more thoughts that you can provide in terms of what it could mean, the more literary analysis you're doing, the deeper you're getting into understanding the full implications of this poem. All right, well now we get to the real central thing. Number four, what might the worm and the rose represent as symbols? Okay, well, let's start with the idea that it's a woman. It's a woman or a girl, the rose is. Okay, because it's often associated with feminine beauty, right? Um, so, in that case, um, we have this suggestion that it, the worm has found out the rose's bed. So the suggestion of a bed, right? A woman in a bed, okay? Sexual suggestion, right? Even a worm, that, that image of a worm and the penetrating, it could almost be, and some of you guys pointed this out, it could almost be like a penis, right? This could be a sexual poem and it has sexual language, right? He's found out thy bed. Well, the bed can be a flower bed or it can be literally a bed that somebody would lay in or where somebody would make love, where somebody would have sex. And the, the worm has a dark secret love, which gives it this weird, dark, illegal sort of thing, right? So what is this? Is it an um, illegal love affair? Is the woman married and she's cheating on her husband? Is that, does that what, that what we're talking about here, right? Um, is it uh, a relationship your parents, you don't want your parents to know about? Is this a secret love affair? I don't want you hanging out with that boy, <laughs> right? And then, then you do. So it's this thing and it, and it consumes you or it eats away at you because you feel guilty or bad or you're afraid of getting caught, right? Any of this stuff is powerfully 
suggested by the poem. Maybe the, uh, the love affair is not consensual. Maybe it's this horrible rape experience. I mean, again, just looking at it in a sexual dimension, the poem's incredibly rich and dark and disturbing, right? This is not a love poem. It's, it's a poem maybe about love gone wrong, right? Do, do love affairs and relationships go bad? Are you kidding me? You know, more often than not, they do. <laughs> That's why when you find that special one, put lots of effort in and hang on tight. All right. So sure, maybe this is not just a poem about a worm and a flower. Maybe this is a poem about some sort of dark, illicit, but kind of hot and passionate love affair. Right. Yes, absolutely. And if you're getting to that level, then you are starting to understand how to read a symbol. Right. But again, the really great symbols mean more than just one thing. So the more ideas we can come up with and generate about its meaning, the richer is our reading of the poem. So I just gave you guys four suggestions here about what a rose could represent. And then the question is, what would destroy those things? What does the worm represent in this equation? In the case of beauty, let's say that the rose represents beauty, which it so often does, all right? What happens to beauty though? Do people stay beautiful forever? They don't, right? So what is it that destroys beauty? We talked about the worm destroying the rose. So let's look at other things that fall into those patterns. Um, beauty, right? <clears throat> look at me. <laughs> I was never beautiful, but I used to be more beautiful than this. Um, what happened? Time. Maybe the worm represents time. And beauty is beautiful while it lasts, but already inside, right? It's as if time is already digging inside or already starting to have its effect. And it's just a matter of time until the rose dies or is no longer beautiful or is dried out and crusty like that old sugary sweet in the poem Dream Deferred. So beauty gets destroyed by time, right? Or maybe a hard life. If you have stress all the time, it can take away your beauty. Could that be what the worm is? Ah, now look at what we're looking at. We're, we've looked at two different symbolic levels in this poem. What if it is a, what is it? What if it's love, right? We talked about this a little bit. Maybe this is a, about doing the nasty, about sex. Maybe it's about a, a, a more spiritual love though that begins innocently and everybody's happy. But what happens? Maybe somebody gets tired of the person. Maybe the love starts to get old. Maybe you start taking each other for granted right? Maybe the worm represents this thing, this aspect of a love relationship where you just get tired of each other. It's not the same as time, right? It's just uh, you no longer get along or connect in the way that you used to, okay? Um, it could be, uh, well, I also said passion, same thing, right? A relationship can start out passionately and then the passion can die away. They say it takes about seven years <laughs> or so in a marriage, uh, but, but sometimes marriages lose their love, right? So now are we talking about a marriage? Are we talking about a true love relationship? Are we talking about a sexual relationship? Yes. That's the power of a symbol. And in each case, what does the worm represent? It, it's an agent of destruction. So just take that extra leap of thought, right? And you can begin to see reflections of this pattern in the poem all around out there in the, in the so-called real human world. Uh, life? I don't know. What happens to life after a while? <laughs> you die, right? Maybe the worm is death. And the worm represents death in a lot of poems because if you die and they bury you, your body, right? What happens to your body? Well, the worms come. The worms come. I hate to be so disturbing, but this is a dark little poem you start to discover. And maybe the worm represents that element, right? <clears throat> in short, this is a poem about all kinds of stuff. It's about the corruption of life by death, the corruption of beauty by time, the corruption of love perhaps by jealousy, right? Maybe it's one of those things where um, someone is so jealous that they ruin the relationship. Or maybe it's one of those control things where you know the, the, the boyfriend is often looking at the girl and if it's a heterosexual relationship, going like, you know, hey, why are you talking to that guy? Huh? So you're talking to that guy. I don't know, you're not going to talk, you're my girlfriend, you belong to me, you're an object, right? That's the sort of thing that's a nasty aspect of love also. And maybe that's what this poem is talking about. We don't know what William Blake actually meant, but maybe he meant all these things. Is it possible he's so good that he can write a poem that we can interpret on five or six or seven different levels? 
happens all the time. The great writers, that's what they do. That's why we bother to study literature, boys and girls. Um, the rose could be innocence. You're just a kid and then the world comes at you and you have these experiences that make you no longer a child. Maybe you find out that there's no Santa Claus or you know these other things, right? But you learn things and it changes you away from being just a, a little kid. You're no longer innocent. Now you are an adult. And maybe it's that sexual dimension of adulthood too that this poem's talking about. When you go through puberty, you're not a kid anymore. You know, you change fundamentally and you change as a person. You become a grown up, God help you. All right. Maybe it is anything good destroyed by anything evil. Maybe we can interpret this in a Christian way, right? Um, imagination by reason. Maybe you're imaginative when you're a kid and then you learn to reason. You're like, well, none of that could happen. Uh, you know, and you kill your imagination with school. Maybe the worm is school, right? School kills your creativity and your imagination. Everybody's an artist when they're in kindergarten or first grade. Oh, it's finger painting time. Yay. But then think about by the time you're in middle school, how many people see themselves as artists anymore? You know, you can't blame it all on school, but something has happened to your natural wonderfulness. Maybe the rose represents your creativity or your imagination or your artistic ability. And the worm is school that came in and convinced you you weren't an artist or that didn't let you think creatively enough and made you just think in this regimented way, right? Um, again, it could be a marriage that's destroyed by cheating. There's so much in this poem about this dark secret love, right? It makes it seem kind of hot and passionate, but yet sort of creepy and illegal or illicit at the same time, okay? So in the final analysis, what is this poem about? It's about anything that's beautiful or desirable or good, wasting away or being corrupted or being penetrated or being compromised, uh, attacked in some way, all right? And suddenly we've looked at this in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven or eight different levels, right? That's what a great poem can do. The poem goes on. Number five, what might the night and the storm represent as symbols? Night, a time of darkness, right? Is it depression? Could night represent a, an emotional state of depression that's caused by all this stuff or concern, fear of getting caught? And then the storm also, this chaos. A lot of you guys talked about the storm as um, this emotional upset, right? Absolutely, the night and the storm, these two kind of scary, disturbing uh, times. And it, it gives an emotional feeling background to this poem, sort of. All right. So I don't know about you guys. Uh, in the end, if you don't want to go read William Blake on your own, I understand. But I at least want you guys to appreciate some of this artistry. And I like to think that this stuff will help you out in your other English classes as you go on. here. All right. Let's uh, kill the screen share. And ah, I always hate that part. It's me again. Um, anyway, hope you guys enjoyed the poem. Give me that work as you can. Um, I hope you're all well. It looks like another beautiful day out there. So, uh, you know, try to take a walk or something if you can. I don't think I took a walk all yesterday. So, uh, anyway, um, I will check in with you guys on Thursday, and I'll give you your last little assignment. One last little assignment. One more very short poem, um, and uh, we'll kind of wrap up this figurative language inquiry, and uh, we'll really wrap up the year. And I really hope I get to see you guys in August, but I don't know what – what's going to happen with the reopening of school, but let's not even think about that. You guys have a summer before you, the school year's ending, and I really do hope that all is well. So check in with you Thursday. Between now and Thursday, I'm asking only for a dear log. Submit that to me when you can. I hope it's obvious that late work, it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> Just give me the work as you can, um, and let's continue the learning process, shall we? All right, take care, you guys. I will check in with you on Thursday, and in the meantime,